Okay, we're driving from Damba to Tagong from the lowlands of the Tibetan Plateau to the high altitude grasslands where yaks graze. And we're about halfway along the drive. Behind me right here is Yala Shueshan or Yala Snow Mountain. This is a huge mountain comparable to Mount Denali in Alaska in its size over 6,000 meters, over 18,000 feet. Obviously very severe to get up this mountain you would need pretty extreme mountaineering skills. We're not going up that, but we are driving around it and uh, taking some pictures here at this holy Tibetan tree with prayer flags. And uh, this is a beautiful drive. Okay, we are driving from Damba to Tagong from 2,000 meters to 3,800 meters. So we're getting up the mountains, we're moving through this beautiful forest stream here. And right along the stream is a Tibetan hot spring, a local natural hot spring. So this is pretty fun. A couple of Tibetan ladies were just uh, soaking their feet in here. And uh, yeah, this is probably about 40 degrees Celsius and uh, a nice place to hang out with the local Tibetan people. We're at 3,580 meters, and we got this big boy yak behind us. He's uh, just kind of hanging out, chilling in the sun. And uh, we are here at Hui Yan Si. That is a monastery with about 100 monks in it, and we're gonna be walking around this monastery for the next couple minutes. The sky is blue, the mountains are snowy, and uh, this is gonna be a great monastery. And the yak is super excited. Look at all these stupas outside the monastery here. There must be hundreds of these things. It just keeps going and going forever. Geez, I've never seen so many stupas in my life. Wow. Okay, we're in the inner courtyard of Hui Yan Se. This is the old courtyard, uh, often used for monk debates. You can see it's just this huge grassy field. It's probably about half as big as a football pitch and uh, probably about 50 yards long. It just has these beautiful yellow flowers, dandelions, grass, just feels very natural. It's not cement like a lot of monastery courtyards, which I really like. It just feels uh, kind of wild and open and then the highlight of course is this beautiful temple right behind me here we're going to be walking inside of this temple and uh, everything 
you see around me all these smaller buildings, these two-story smaller buildings in uh, red wood. This is all monk housing, so this is where the hundred or so monks live. Okay, this is a traditional form of Tibetan architecture, which I really think is quite beautiful. They take these uh, sticks, local shrubs from the mountains here, and because we're at such a high altitude, it's almost 3,800 meters, there's very few trees that grow here, but there are a few small junipers and cedars that grow as kind of shrubby bushes. They take these bushes, they cut them into the same size in bundles, and then they bunch them up and they put them right here on the wall. And then this is actually a form of architecture. You usually find this at the very top of the roof and it helps the, the top of the wall not be so heavy so it doesn't collapse. You can imagine building a building 300, 400 years ago without modern technology and cement and rebar and all that stuff. This would actually help the architecture be a little bit more stable in that the top of the building is not going to be top heavy and fall over. You also see that Tibetan walls are often arced in a little bit of a, a slant or an angle upward and inward so that the, the center of mass is actually kind of focusing inward rather than pushing outward. The, this also has the double function of being a little bit air permeable, which means when you're burning yak butter candles or incense or such things like that, offerings inside of a totally closed monastery with very few windows, that this is going to be a little bit air permeable and allow some of that smoke and some of that stuff over hundreds of years to kind of exit the building and not build up and create a residue. So it's a really beautiful way of Tibetan architecture. Traditionally, this is what you see, and I'm really happy to see this here because a lot of times in modern days they're, they're building it more and more with just kind of maroon concrete but it's nice to see the the old wood style of Buddhist architecture here Okay, we're inside the entrance of the old hall of the monastery. It is eerily quiet. I mean, even though there's hundreds of houses for monks here, I've only seen one monk in the entire place. So I suspect that this is the old monastery and they've built a new monastery just adjacent to this and that's where all the monks are practicing. That or all the monks are out on holiday today. So behind me is this weird kind of looking mosaic piece. And uh, this is actually a Tibetan style poem or Tibetan form of scripture reading, but it's really crazy and super complicated. Because what it is, is in every tiny little square or every kind of little pixel you see here is one letter of the Tibetan alphabet, okay? So you could actually read this many, many different ways. It's kind of like reading like a word jumble puzzle. And uh, the way it works is you can read down, you can read the white, and if you read these separate characters here, each character in one block, then that makes uh, its own particular sentence or saying. If you were to read the blue across, it makes its own sentence or saying. If you read the yellow up or down, it makes its own sentence or saying. And so no matter which way you read, left, right, up, down, diagonal, as long as you stay within the color, it says something which is uh, connotes the Buddhist teachings. And so to put together something like this, of this complexity, I can't imagine writing an English poem that that reads both right, left, up, down, diagonal in every manner, and all the letters kind of match like that, like in a word scramble. So um, pretty amazing, and a lot of thought has been put into this, definitely above my mind. I'm not sure what all the exact scriptures are here, but um, just want to give a shout out to the complexity and thought behind this uh, literary masterpiece here. Behind me in this old hall of the monastery, and actually on most monasteries, Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, you're going to find this feature, which is on top of the monastery, you have these two golden deer statues. In this particular case, they have flags on top of them, but the golden deer statues actually represent 
the deer that were attentive to the sermon or the teachings of the first Buddha after he had attained enlightenment. And so he was also in nature, he was under the Bodhi tree, he had attained enlightenment, and after he attains enlightenment, he then passes on his teachings to these two deer who are in the woods and who kind of are the audience for his first sermon or his, his first teaching. The deer are a reminder for Tibetan Buddhist monks who live here in these monasteries to be attentive to the teachings of the Buddha. The sky is just incredible today. Just blue sky with these big puffy clouds. I mean, this is classic calm Tibet. We have exited the Jarong cultural Tibetan area and entered the calm Tibet cultural region, which is K-H-A-M. And that means a little bit more horses, higher grasslands, higher altitudes, uh, not so much uh, rivers and pandas and bamboo things, but more kind of like high altitude grasslands, a little bit more similar to what you see in Qinghai and Gatsu. Okay, so this is the newer monastery in Huiyuan Si, or Huiyuan Monastery. You can see it's a little bit taller, a little bit more golden, a little bit fancier, brighter colors. Uh, they probably, ooh, and they're ringing the gong. That's really exciting. Um, yeah, so, so this is the newer one. You can just see it's uh, not as much wood, a little bit more stone architecture. So this is actually just built in the last 10 or 20 years, whereas the other one is, is much older. Uh, so I think they were expanding the monastery to open up for more monks coming in residence. And so that's why they built this, this newer temple. But uh, yeah, they're both very sizable. Each holds probably 100 to 200 monks inside of it. Okay, we're walking the Kura along Huiyuan Monastery. You can see these giant prayer wheels next to me. Each of these prayer wheels contains thousands of little pieces of paper. Each are written with a mantra or prayer that says Om Mani Padme Om, which is a prayer for compassion for all living beings to leave the suffering of all living beings. And you can see these wheels are huge. They're taller than me. Many of them are two or three meters tall. And they're also engraved with the traditional Sanskrit prayer, Om Mani Padme Om, which is the same prayer that's on the inside of the prayer wheels. So it's thought that by spinning these wheels that they are releasing prayers of compassion for people in the world. But you can just see, I've just been walking for one or two minutes now, it's over a hundred meters long of these huge prayer wheels and these circle the entire monastery. So pilgrims will come and spin these wheels as an act of worship and devotion. Many times, usually every morning, they'll, they'll get up and spin these wheels before they go to work.